Today's hearing marked another step in what will be a long process toward justice. Uh, I thank the Floyd family, the community, and the people of the state of Minnesota. continue to move forward to a trial. At this time, I'm not in a position to answer any questions. Those of you who don't even know that I do answer questions. However, today, it's supposed to be seen as a motion on is to consider motions that have been heard by the court and therefore will not comment on them. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Welcome to Law and Crime Report, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us. That's Attorney Attorney General Keith Ellison, who's spearheading the prosecution out in Minnesota in the George Floyd case. Now, the judge who's presiding over this trial has just ruled uh, that the four former officers who've been charged in connection with Floyd's death, that he has officially upheld his decision to live stream the proceedings, which are set to begin in March of 2021. Now, this goes against what the prosecution ultimately wanted. They wanted to limit this coverage, and they say this violates court rules. Well, joining me to discuss this is law and crime, uh, is trial attorney, excuse me, uh, Catherine Smith. Catherine, great to have you here. Uh, I want to start with this really big bombshell of a ruling because the judge said, look, you know, the, the court rules, yeah, I know they tell me to do something, but this is a unique case. We have to preserve justice. What was the judge's rationale here, and do you think it's the right decision? I do think it's the right decision. Um, a lot of times these independent rules of the court are not set in stone, they're not constitutionally mandated. So for good reason, they can be changed. And here, where live media coverage of what's going on would be paramount to the country's interests, because this had garnered so much attention, we don't want to have any inference that these proceedings are being swept under the rug or being kept secret for any way. So I think that it was a right decision by the court. You have to explain to me why the prosecutors, why the state doesn't want this. They've said it might, uh, you know, witnesses might not want to testify. Uh, there would be issues in terms of a fair trial. But like you said, there's so much riding on this. Don't they want to show every aspect of this trial? Don't they want transparency? Why were they fighting so hard? to limit cameras in that courtroom. I mean, even uh, Attorney General Ellison said, hey, listen, if you can't, if you're not going to allow, if, you, if you're going to allow live streaming, then let's only do uh, the opening statements, the closings, if the defendants choose to testify, if or there's a situation, if the witnesses, those specific witnesses actually want to testify, we can show them. He wanted to limit that. But clearly the judge said, no, we're going to do a full live stream. Why do you think the prosecution really didn't want this? I mean, you have to think with any type of um, open access, you also leave yourself open to a lot more scrutiny. And there is a concern that witnesses would feel more concerned to come forward when there is publicity. There is that valid concern. But I, I, in my heart of hearts, I think it has to do with criticism. They don't want to have their case picked apart by uh, the court of public opinion more than they already need to. You think that's what it is? That's that's all that it is? Because I can't, th I have to think, going into this trial, the advantage seems to be this for the state. I mean, how on earth can you get an impartial jury in this kind of trial when it's not everybody in just Minnesota knows about it, everybody in the whole country and international knows about it as well. And, and I just feel that there's an advantage to the state here, whether or not there are cameras in that courtroom. Well, you might have hit on it, Jesse, that there are other concerns, which is the idea that the jurors um, who are going to be participating in the trial might be watching media coverage that's more accessible and, more, and that more scrutiny so that they are considering stuff that's outside of what they're supposed to just be getting in court. So there is that concern that the more layers of uh, commentary that are actually happening live to what's going on in the court might feed into the jury's perspective. So I can understand those concerns, but again, every lots of decisions like this are balancing acts by the court, right? You have to weigh those concerns along with the public interest. And I think it, the public interest far outweighs those concerns. You know what's interesting about this? The defense wants cameras. They want to show every aspect of this trial. They want to set the record straight for the, their clients. 
And if their, their clients lose, if these defendants ultimately are convicted, they can't argue then in an appeal, well, you know, uh, we shouldn't have broadcast this. There was the b bad error on the judge. It's not like the prosecution has been fighting for this and the defense lost. The defense just won this. They wanted cameras in there. So they're kind of limiting themselves, right? If they lose, yeah. they can't then argue in an appeals court, well, you know, it was not fair to our clients. There was too much publicity. You're 100% right. I think it's backwards in the way that this is going about. If I were the defense attorneys, I would argue up, down, and sideways that there should not be cameras in the court, that that was a violation of my client's rights. And if, if for no other reason than you just said, to cue it up for an appeal, because if you don't make that argument now or officially within the court, you can't then later argue it. So a tactic is to argue all sorts of avenues that you might be able to have an appeal later. You need to be thinking forward to those steps. So they've waived that possibility to later argue this. It's puzzling. All right. Well, before we switch topics, I have with me long crime legal analyst, Jonna Spilbors with us. We were having some connectivity issues, but Jonna, you're with us. Welcome mm -hmm. back. And I want to give you an nice opportunity to, to talk about this. What Good to see you. When, what can we expect in March of 2021 when this trial is broadcast for the world, including here on Law & Crime? What are you expecting mm -hmm. to see? Well, if I can respectfully disagree with both of my colleagues here, because I think it's an interesting strategy to have uh, pretrial publicity or publicity in the courtroom when the trial is actually going on on behalf of the defense, because let's hearken back to when this first happened. and the outrage, rightful outrage perhaps, when this first aired and we saw the image of the officer with the knee on George Floyd's neck and how long he left it there and, and the tragedy that ensued. But what we didn't see is the other side of the story. And I think the defense plans to bring that out during the trial. And it's, it's their only way. If cameras are in that courtroom or streaming live, it's the only way to get that other side out and change the perspective of the court of public opinion. And that's why I think we're going to be glued to the TV screen when this trial happens. There are going to be a ton of eyeballs. There are going to be a lot of people agreeing, disagreeing, a lot of analysis. Hopefully we'll have you both here back in March when this ultimately starts up. But we do have to switch gears, and I want to focus on a different case. This is a sad one. This is out of California. 34-year-old Maurice Jewell Taylor has been arrested and charged for allegedly decapitating his two children ages 12 and 13. And if you thought that wasn't horrible enough, he's also accused of forcibly keeping his younger sons ages 8 and 9 in rooms without food for days as they had to look upon the mutilated corpses of their siblings. That's what we're dealing with. Now, he faces two counts of felony murder, two counts of child abuse. He's in jail on $4.2 million bail. Yesterday was his arraignment, and I'm just going to tell you this, it was strange. Take a look. Several attempts on my life in jail, and I want to represent myself so I can have this case go as fast as possible. Because if I get sent back to jail today, I'm going to get killed. And I have evidence that there's a hit on me and that the police are involved. And they've already tried to kill me. And you keep trying to make me get a lawyer that's going to delay things to send me back to jail so I'll get killed. And I don't, I don't appreciate that. And I don't think it's fair that, you're, you're, that, that, you're, that, that this is happening. There's evidence that they tried to kill me when they arrested me. I literally had to go to the hospital when they arrested me when I was fine. I don't want to go back in the police custody. I want to just do the trial now. I don't want an attorney. And that there's a hit out on me, and I have proof. It's on social media. And if I have an attorney, he's going to have the right thing to see me back on his prison bus, and they're going to kill me. Johnny, you have a guy who fires his attorney, wants to represent himself, wants to go to trial yesterday. He wanted it to start yesterday. He's okay. accused of a horribly sadistic crime. And by all accounts, this came out of nowhere. I mean, people who knew him said he was a right. nice guy, a fitness trainer. Are we dealing with a, a serious case of maybe a mental health defense? I would say so. I mean, look, I want to hate this guy. I want to hate this guy just based on the allegations. But obviously, there's something wrong. And I don't mean to be flippant about this subject at all, but most people think that if you want to represent yourself, you're already, there's something crazy about you because that's a typically a dumb idea. But for him to be rambling on, being more concerned that, that 
there's a hit on him and the police want him dead. And and maybe they don't like him because of the, the horrible things that he's accused of doing. But to have that be your main uh, affect as opposed to two of your children are dead and decapitated. I mean, there's really something wrong here. Obviously, there's going to be a mental health, perhaps a mental health defense. If not, they're going to investigate to make sure that this person is capable of assisting in his own defense and isn't incompetent and or insane. Uh, Catherine, there's a lot that we have to get to in this case. And, and I want to ask you this. Really, there were, didn't seem to be a way to prevent this from happening. I don't believe or there's it hasn't been clear if child services were ever involved. It's not clear if that happened. I believe there was a friend of the grandmother who wanted to, you know, have her the, her friend, this grandmother, be more involved in the children's lives. She was cut off at one point. There seemed to be tension in the marriage here between the defendant and his wife. But it it just seems like this came out of nowhere. I mean, what do you think about this? I think it's so weird, right? Because we all want to logically think that if something this horrendous was going to happen, that there would be warning signs or that there would be other people to blame because this should never happen, right? The odd part is I find that his wife isn't being charged. Um, so there's no inference that this has been systemic in the sense that she was complicit. A lot of times when we see this happen, we see the spouse is also being blamed for some sort of neglect. And so far, we don't see that there. So a case like this just leaves us all with a sense of horror and a general sense of dissatisfaction because we want to really blame everybody for dropping the ball. But at this point, the finger is pointing at him and we don't know who else is really responsible if anyone. Yeah, it, it's bizarre and disturbing. We're going to take a break. We're going to get more into what happened in that arraignment yesterday and we'll talk about what we should be looking out for in this case. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everybody. We're still talking about Maurice Taylor out of California, who's accused of killing two of his children by beheading them and then forcing his other two, to two children to look at the bodies of their siblings for days and not feeding them for days. This is one of the worst cases I've heard in quite some time. Yesterday was this man's arraignment. He wanted to fire his attorney, wants to represent himself, and immediately wants to go to trial, says that his life is in danger in jail. Let's play a little bit more of what happened in that courtroom. You have a right to a speedy and public jury trial. Do you understand what a jury trial is? That's what I'm trying to get right now. That's exactly what I just said. Now, you understand we don't go directly out of this courtroom to another courtroom and start a jury trial. Do you understand that? It, it takes, there's a process that has to occur first. Do you understand that? Yeah, but I think I'm going to get killed in the process. I have evidence. The police tried to kill me. And they put me back in police custody, and I have evidence. I literally have evidence. I have a medical record. It shows what they did to me. All right, sir. There's more evidence. You have, to understand, you have to understand that. That's the real doing what they're doing. So, I mean, if you send me back there, that's my death sentence. All right, sir. I think you're having trouble focusing on the fact that I'm trying to confirm that you understand your rights. Well, I already said I understood them, and I signed for them. Well, no, yes, sir. I, just, I don't feel like I'm being, I don't feel like death threats on my life, or I don't feel like I have human rights right now. So it's hard for me to sit here and just calm down like this is a normal case when my human rights have been taken away. All right. I don't think that it's fair. I'm a human being. Even if people think that I'm guilty, I'm a human being and I have human rights. I shouldn't have to use a paper bag or my hand for toilet paper. Like, I don't understand. I shouldn't have to worry about guards trying to beat me. I shouldn't worry about the inmates saying that they're going to kill me that the guards are telling them that I'm going around murdering children. I don't, I don't, like, like, why are my human rights being taken away and nobody cares? John, let me turn it over to you. The judge ordered a mental health evaluation based upon what he yeah. saw yesterday. And the, the defendant will be back in court January 6th. Walk us through this process of how the mental evaluation works, what could happen, um, and what should we be looking out for? All right. Well, typically, a mental health evaluation is going to establish whether or not a defendant, in this case, this defendant, is able to assist in his own defense. Does he understand the nature of the proceedings and the charges against him? So this is going to be first and foremost. And it's not to determine whether he's legally insane or not. It's to determine whether he's competent to stand trial. Because as this judge pointed out, he's rambling. 
he's rambling and he's not focused on what the issue was at hand. And that is, you know, reading his rights and getting him to understand and acknowledge that he understands those rights. So that will happen in the initial evaluation. And if he's found that he is competent to stand trial at some later point, his defense might establish whether or not he's going to present an insanity defense. Well, let me just follow up with you there, John, on one thing real quick. Can he be forced an attorney? If, if he really wants to represent himself, you see the way what's going on right here. This is just an arraignment. Imagine what happens in a trial. Could he be forced an attorney? Usually you can't be forced to have an attorney represent you. Sometimes in capital cases, it would be, that could be different. Uh, and I don't know if they're charging this as a capital case or not, so forgive me. But if you you have the right to the attorney of your choosing, even if that attorney, quote, attorney, is yourself. It is a crazy, dumb idea. They might have an attorney standing by to sort of assist him, but not be the official attorney. This guy can't represent himself, right. Jesse. He doesn't know which way is up. So it would be in incredibly crazy to do that. So we'll see. I think the, the mental health evaluation is going to be very revealing. And we can't do much until that comes back. It, it, it may be that he doesn't know which way is up or he's pretending to not know which way is up. We'll, we'll see what That's this mental true. evaluation says. Let's play a little bit more of this arraignment uh, from yesterday that was kind of wild. At this point, sir, I actually have a doubt of your uh, mental state, and I'm suspending proceedings under 1368 of the Penal Code, referring the matter for an evaluation to bring you back to court on this, and we will determine the issues going forward as to your well, sir, there's several things that lead me in this direction. What you've started doing now is interrupting me, and while I don't take it personally and I bear no anger towards you, uh, it is inconsistent with somebody properly representing themselves by showing the, uh, the necessary deference to other people speaking, including the court or opposing counsel. Katie, over to you. You had mentioned something before. I want to harp on it. The mother of these children, the uh, you know, who was in that house, she has not been charged with a crime. She is not a suspect. What does that tell you? And could she be charged with something later on? Because again, reports on what the history was was between her and Taylor are kind of interesting. That. They, they, they were overheard fighting at times, that she was very rough on him. Now, I don't know anything about this. I don't know the, the in, ins and outs of their relationship, but she was there. So what does this mean that she hasn't been charged, and could she be charged later on? I'm not super surprised that she hasn't been charged yet, because that requires a little bit more, obviously more proof. But what I am very surprised is she's not necessarily a suspect, that they've, they've precluded at this juncture, at least, the idea that they're not even looking into whether or not she has any criminal involvement. Because as we've seen in many of these types of cases, um, there are separate uh, legal charges that you can have, criminal charges, for not stepping in when you see someone being abused. So yes, to answer your question, she could later be charged. Um, she could, of course, later become a suspect. But what I read from this is that this was more of a sudden act they don't believe that there was long-term abuse that she participated in or failed to prevent. Again, as they uncover more details, of course, these things can change. But the affirmative statement that she's not a suspect is telling to me. Now, Katie, let me just stick with you on for a second. We talked about this in the break. I, I can't tell what's more horrifying, the two kids who were decapitated or the two kids who were forced to look at the bodies of their siblings for days they were not fed food. They, I don't know if they were locked in their rooms, but they were forcibly kept in those rooms. What happens to them? I mean, really, what happens to those kids? Uh, what role do they play in this upcoming trial? Are they going to be witnesses? Um, and how do they get the help that they need? Because this is one of the most, I imagine, one of the most traumatic things that anyone could witness. And so I, I'm just curious what happens to them now. I mean, it's horrible. This is the stuff of, of nightmares that healthy people can't even conceive of as a reality, let alone being a child exposed to this. 
obviously these children are going to need an enormous amount of counseling and assistance. And oftentimes the district attorney's office will supply victim services and, and help in that regard while simultaneously evaluating whether or not they would be appropriate witnesses. I think everybody across the board does not want to see these kids put through any more torture. So I think to the extent it can be avoided, they're not going to testify. But to your point, Jesse, I mean, they, they were witnesses. Technically, that's still a possibility. So hopefully we're going to see that not happen because I'm sure that would be more traumatic. And hopefully they're going to be getting the assistance that they need and put in um, care where they're being properly cared for to the extent their mother has any involvement. And let me ask you this, Jana. There, there was we talked about it earlier. How this came to be? Apparently, the grandmother had a relationship, and then was kind of cut out of the family, maybe by the defendant. That is one of the reports. It's one of the allegations. Uh, mm -hmm. How is that going to play into this? Because again, we have a guy who's a fitness trainer. Everyone seemed to like him. The pandemic mm -hmm. hits. He starts doing these classes on Zoom. They the, his clients start to realize something's a little off. You know, we, how many times have we covered cases where people, because of the pandemic, you're seeing an increase in domestic violence on a lot of uh, uh, different crimes being committed, not saying that's right. what happened here. But how much right. is the background of what happened important for here? You know, that's a really interesting question, because I don't think the, the mother-in-law is going to say, oh, she was cut out. And I don't think that sort of bad character evidence is going to make or break this case. What really has me curious, two things. Number one, is this the case of somebody who perhaps had a mental illness, was medicated, and then during the pandemic stopped taking medication, which would could change his behavior? I mean, this is just so incredibly egregious, it's hard to, to fathom. And two, if we could just go back to one quick point, I'm surprised that the mother is not being charged with any sort of reckless endangerment for having those other two children sit there for days, you know, in the company of deca their decapitated siblings. I mean, that should be a charge. I know it's well, relatively minor compared compared to the murder, but she's not being charged with that. Well, and I well that's presuming she could have done something, right? I mean, there is the possibility she was being kept at, from interfering in any which way, and oh. maybe we'll learn more about what happened? Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. I, I'll tell you what, though. So he has this mental evaluation, supposed to be back in court January 6th. Hopefully, we'll cover it here on Law and & Crime, and we'll update our viewers on what's happening in this case. We're going to take a break. Yeah. When we come back, some other incredible stories from across the country. Stay tuned. And welcome back, everybody. 22-year-old Benjamin Teeter out of North Carolina pleaded guilty to a terrorism conspiracy charge related to attempting to supply materials to and offering to fight for Hamas. This is a weird one. Teeter confessed that he and another man provided weapons suppressors to someone that they thought was part of the terrorist group, but unfortunately for them, that contact was actually an undercover FBI agent. Teeter's a member of an extremist group called the Bugalo Boys, who were present and armed during the George Floyd protests in Minneapolis. Uh, Teeter had allegedly discussed and even planned acts of violence against the government, including blowing up a courthouse. Okay, so Katie, wow. He, he pleads guilty to this. Sentencing is going to happen at a later time. Uh, what is he looking at uh, prison-wise, and why do you think he pled guilty? You know, a lot of times when people plead guilty to these things, it's because they obviously are going to face higher exposure if they go to trial. Um, also, there's, I, I would assume, and I don't know, that he's probably trading some information for a lower sentence, right? Because a lot of times when people are connected to these groups, they'll have inroads that they can then inform on and let the government know. Uh, I don't know exactly what he's facing in terms of time, but these sentences can be huge. I mean, we're talking like upwards of 20 years to life for some of these things. Again, I don't know exactly what it is in this instance, but I even imagine- Even though he it, never even supplied the materials directly to somebody or was war communicating with somebody with from Hamas. It was all an undercover operation. Yeah, it's the idea of a conspiracy to do so, right? Because he, I, I mean, that's what I would look at and initially saying it's a conspiracy because he's conspiring to aid a, a 
what he believes to be a terrorist organization. These are very, very serious crimes, whether or not he actually supplied the organization. It's sort of like when people um, conspire to commit murder and they accidentally hire a cop who's undercover, they still get charged with solicitation. Now, that's a good point that you raised, Katie. And John, I want to ask you about it. This idea that Teeter might be implicating other people because he seems to have implicated another member of this group, Michael Robert Solomon. Maybe he's implicating others. Um, and is that a way for the government to, like, you, if you listen, if you agree with what Katie said, that he's trading in information, are they trying to infiltrate this group? Is the government trying to take down this extremist group, which is, you know, an anti government? extremist organization? Yeah, I think the answer is clearly they are, because obviously they've targeted this group. They set up basically a sting in order to catch this person. And obviously, when you're when you're trying to sell things to a potential terrorist group, you're not acting alone. You're acting in concert, obviously, to, to get the job done. Ironically, I this is the first, researching this story is the first time I ever heard of the Boogaloo group. So I don't know how mainstream they are, but usually these types of kind of fringe organizations usually end up outing themselves because they post on social media and like they don't care. They're, they're this different breed of social justice warriors that are really um, just irreverent about what they do and what they claim to want to do. And they end up just getting caught that way. And it's not that hard. So I guess that's good for the rest of us because that doesn't make them any less dangerous. You mean like the suspects who are accused of trying to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer? There's a kind of a theme there, I guess, as well. And I guess, John, let me just stick with you on this. It's impressive when we see these kind of sting operations happening. Is this typical that you have undercover agents as a way to, you know, capture these people to as part of these extremist groups? Is this typical to have undercover agents operating in this kind of realm? Oh, absolutely. And in, in fact, I don't know if it's not that easy to catch them without having people going undercover, obviously, because that's the, the nature of the biz, so to speak. They're not going to be trying to sell arms to uniformed uh, officers or anything like that. So you do need that element to get in there and really dig into the figurative brain of these fringe organizations. And that's what fortunately happened here. And I'm sure like this guy might be the first, but he's not going to be the last to be facing charges in this in this instance. Yeah. And he might be trading information like you guys said. So who knows? But mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, we're going to move from one high profile story to a different high profile story, because how many of you out there are fans of The Real Housewives? Well, the husband of star Erica Jane is in some very hot water. I'm talking, of course, about a man named Thomas Girardi. So an Illinois judge held that Mr. Girardi, who's an attorney, and his law firm held him in contempt of court for refusing to tell the court what happened to $2 million settlement money that was apparently owed to clients who lost family in an airplane crash. In a lawsuit filed by another law firm, and it's alleged that Girardi embezzled the settlement money for personal use, and Erica Jane took full advantage of it. And in, this is, quote, uh, they wanted to project a public image of obscene wealth at all times at whatever the cost. The judge ordered a freeze on Girardi's assets and is now going to get the U.S. Attorney's Office involved. Okay, so Katie, we have Girardi. He claims he can't pay the $2 million, refused to say what ultimately happened to it. What does that tell you? Bad news, man. I mean, as you all know, rule number one with attorneys is, is you don't spend your client's money. It's like the worst thing you could possibly do. And there's no reason that that $2 Probably million- not the dollars worst thing you could do, but one of the worst things you could do. <laughs> well, pretty okay, bad. There are other, it's pretty bad. It's really bad. Because mm -hmm, there's bad. no reason that that money was missing unless he spent it. And you're not supposed to send your, spend your client's money. I mean, call it whatever you want. It's stealing. And the fact that he's failing to provide evidence to the court of what happened to that money leads you to the obvious inference that he took it, right? Yeah, and now the U.S. Attorney's Office is getting involved, John. What does that mean? Well, it means that this could go from a fee dispute on one hand to criminal charges on the other hand. This is actually very scary. And, you know, the three of us are lawyers. And I have to agree with Katie that rule number one is 
You cannot, you don't even want to accidentally like do bad math when it comes to your client's funds. You don't because oh, it's yeah. very scary. And what's, what's curious in this case is that if there is a fee dispute, all of the bars in all 50 states have a means for clients to complain to the bar. Like it doesn't turn into a big thing. It gets resolved sort of through arbitration. This has gone beyond that. Obviously, if they're getting the U.S. attorney involved, so there's a lot more here than meets the eye, and we're missing like a big chunk of what happened in between him representing these few clients, and did he get a settlement check? Did he not get a settlement check? We're not quite sure. That part is not clear from the story so far. Well, Katie, I'm going to turn it now to the, the question that everybody wants to know who's a fan of the show. What happens to Erica Jane? She is named in this lawsuit by this law firm. It seems to suggest she knew what was going on, at least took advantage of this wealthy lifestyle that might have been funded from the settlement money. What happens to Erica Jane now? Yeah, just like we talked about before, I think they're really putting her in a position where she's being pressured to rat out her husband, right? It, just because you're married to someone doesn't mean necessarily that you're involved in some sort of ploy that their law firm had, to the extent he was even doing anything wrong, right? I think it's a stretch to add her on if there's no other direct evidence that she was involved in either possession of stolen property or actively involved in stealing stuff. I mean, as you know, she recently started to try to sell her clothing and was even ordered by the court to stop doing that. So I, I really agree that we're missing probably a large portion of this such that we can't give a very detailed perspective about what everyone's roles are. But the, if the fact that they're looking at her is, is compelling. Well, Jonna, Erica has apparently uh, filed for divorce. The suit uh, that I mentioned alleges that the divorce that Erica filed was to try to escape the consequences of her, action, uh, her actions. And her husband claims that he's broke. So again, what does this tell you? <laughs> Well, first of all, I think if she did file a divorce and she is still in love with her husband, it could be a ploy to try to protect the marital estate, right? They could be trying to protect the marital assets from this impending lawsuit, which wouldn't be a crime. It'd be a little drastic to divorce your husband if you're still in love with them in order to do that. But can I just say, at the risk of being ageist, you know, there's a huge age gap between Erica Jane and her husband. And I don't know if they were so much soulmates since there's like a 30 or 40 year age gap or if maybe she was more in love with his wallet. And if that starts to shrink, well, she wants to be a free agent. I'm just speculating here, though. You, you don't believe in true love. I see that's what we're learning here, uh, Jonna. You just don't believe in true love at I get that. all. I'm and that's so what that means. I mean, I think it, I, I think he's 81 years old, and, and that's the question here. You know, uh, Katie, you can't say this is a lawyer who's inexperienced and new and maybe didn't know what was going on, a mistake. This is a guy who's been around the block. So it clearly, like you said, seems to show that he knew what he was doing. You know, on the other hand, there is a point at which some people stop becoming involved actively in the affairs of the law firms that they run. Are they legally responsible for what happens? It usually, it, it depends, but... It could be that he was just a, named, a name on the door and nothing more. And so to what extent was he actively involved in these decisions? I think we're going to get a lot more information to come. All right. Well, let's take a break because we have more stories to talk about. We'll be right back right after this. All right, let's go over to Tennessee. 34-year-old Jeremy Fitzgerald and 29-year-old Terlicia Turner have been charged with kidnapping a two-year-old who was found at a Goodwill in Mississippi. So this was all apparently part of a plot where Fitzgerald allegedly propositioned the boy's mother to work as a prostitute for him. She refused, and then he tried to ransom the boy. Well, when that didn't work, uh, the pair ended up traveling state lines and abandoning the child at this center. Weird case. Uh, Katie, I'll start with you. Serious charges. I mean, apparently could face life in prison if convicted. How strong is the evidence against these two? It sounds pretty strong. I mean, we obviously have um, video photographic evidence 
um, we have the testimony of the mother. I mean, again, oftentimes you need more, right, than just the testimony of a complainant. That's usually enough to get the person arrested in most states. But you oftentimes will need more than just one complainant to move that dial. So I anticipate that we're going to be getting a lot more evidence. And I bet that this is not the first time this happened. This is a very extreme, uh, cruel plot. And I'm sure that there's something in their past that had led up to this point. It's very crazy. Jana, is one of the parties, is Turner um, less culpable than Fitzgerald? Because when you read these court documents, it seems to suggest she knew every part of what was happening, and I think they were keen to show that. Uh, however, you have two different parties here, and you almost wonder if Fitzgerald was more in the driver's seat. How would that play out? You know, that's interesting, because one of the other stories we were talking about earlier, if this is deemed a conspiracy then it's not really going to matter who is in the driver's seat because they both could be equally culpable. But on the other hand, if prosecutors don't have enough evidence, and we're going to have to wait and see, they might want to, they might need the person who's less culpable to turn on the person who's more culpable so they wouldn't be prosecuted uh, equally. Somebody might get a little bit of a break. The one who's providing the, the most of the evidence, in other words, would get a little bit of a break. So that'll be interesting. That'll be interesting to tell. But can I just say one thing that I think is fortunate about this? This is another horrible case. And whenever we have cases involving children, they're, they're typically horrible. But thankfully, this child is unharmed. I mean, this is egregious what they did. But you know, we get so many other cases where these children go missing and then they turn up dead. This fortunately is not that. That's the one teeny tiny saving grace of this case. You took the words right out of my mouth. That's what I was about to say. I mean, how many times do we deal with situations where people feel that they're cornered and they end up killing the, right. uh, their, their victim? They end up killing the person that they kidnapped. And, and so, Katie, what we do know is that apparently this young boy, when he was found, he had a note with him. Uh, he had a grocery bag. There was some clothing, but he had a note. Um, and the note that said, uh, child abandoned, no phone number for the mom. Uh, an employee who worked at this Goodwill had said that the, the suspect had said the child's mother couldn't care for him. What does that tell you? I mean, left this boy out there, uh, seemingly suggesting the mother is to blame, but again, just abandoning him right there. What does that tell you? I mean, I guess it's better than hurting him, right? I mean, I guess there is that benefit in the overall sense of things, but it, it shows that that they were trying to utilize him as a ploy, that this wasn't about viciousness, that they were trying to gain influence over his mother, try to force her to do things or get money. Um, so, of course, it's great that he wasn't injured, but that doesn't erase the fact that what they did across straight lines was extremely serious. I mean, we're talking about extortion, um, compelling someone right. to into prostitution, um, and kidnapping. I mean, this is it's really bad. Uh, John, let me just ask you this real quick. Could the mother face any consequences? Because there's an argument that she left her child with somebody that she wasn't familiar with. Again, the, st the, th the story was that the mother had uh, thought that Fitzgerald had left her son with her, his sister. Turns out she found that it was the girlfriend. But is the mother right. somehow culpable in all this? Is she responsible? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that because I have a nagging sense. Like, I, I, listen, I, I'm not prosecuting this case, but could the mother actually somehow be in on it? Could this be a whole giant concocted story a la you know, Casey Anthony, in a sense, where there's this big con concocted story and a child goes missing. And, and, and in that case, unfortunately, uh, her daughter died. But in this case, it, we had a different result. Could there be, are they all in cahoots? I don't know. So I don't think investigators are going to let her up for air anytime soon. She's got some valuable information either way. It's an incredible story, a weird story. It might be early to say that, but uh, look, I'm just happy the two-year-old is okay and we'll move on yeah. from there. I want to f uh, close out the show with an absolutely incredible story. This concerns a man named Walter Forbes. Walter Forbes was released from prison almost 40 years after seemingly being wrongfully convicted. Forbes had been found guilty of murdering a man named Dennis Hall, who he got into a violent altercation with on a previous occasion. Prosecutors had said Forbes killed Hall by setting fire to his apartment complex, and the conviction was based on the shaky testimony of a woman who finally admitted the truth in 2017 and said she was pressured to implicate Forbes. The Michigan man was released in November. So, Katie, 
I don't understand how this could have happened. Her testimony, this woman's testimony was inconsistent with the evidence at the time, like the color of the gas cans was off, where the gas was poured. There was strong evidence um, that the building's owner was the one responsible for the fire, and yet it took all this time. Explain that to me. Some of this is really hard to explain because it's hard for me to understand too. A lot of times when when we have these types of cases that go to trial and get before a jury and there's inconsistent evidence, the judge says that is a dispute of fact. I as a judge can't make a credibility determination. That's up to you to the, as the jury to do so. So if the jury listened to her and believed her and found it and, and secured a conviction, it's really hard for that to get reversed. We see cases where the witness recants and they still end up re-prosecuting. We don't see that here because it appears that there's no other evidence. But the fact that this took so long, and in fact, she uh, recanted in 2017, he's only now being released. I mean, it's just a miscarriage of justice in every which way. Recant, she, she said she couldn't even definitively say if he was even involved whatsoever. She had no idea. And so here's the thing, Jana. It took so long partly because of the prosecution. Right? The prosecutors were hit with this evidence from, the, I believe, the Innocence Project, and yet they still mm -hmm. said it didn't meet the threshold. It wasn't enough, and they kept him in prison. And, and I don't understand what the, because the prosecutor really is supposed to look for justice. It's not to win a case or secure their case, but to look for justice. Why were they so keen on keeping Forbes in prison? See, and that's true, but you got to remember a couple of things. Number one, nobody likes to have egg on their face. And the reason why this man spent 40 years in prison is because 40 years ago, he was prosecuted on the state of the evidence that they had at the time. That's the first thing to keep in mind. The second thing to keep in mind is, forensically, we are far better now than we were 40 years ago in terms of the presentation of evidence. In other words, in my opinion, it was a lot easier to get false convictions 40 years ago, especially when you had to rely on forensics that we have now that perhaps we didn't have then. And three, when a prosecution gets any sort of appeal of this nature that is going to flip a conviction on its head, I think they do have a duty to investigate to make sure that the new information isn't the false information. Why would somebody come forward 40 years later and completely recant? And why wasn't that picked up? 40 years ago when we're just talking about testimony now. There's nothing forensic about that. It's about just, you know, a person telling the story up on the stand. So I would be suspicious, too, as a prosecutor, getting this new information. And for that reason, I'm sure they had to wind their way through the court. And, you know, justice can be really slow sometimes. Katie, he was in behind bars for a crime he seemingly didn't commit for almost four decades. I want everyone to think about that, 38 years. Does he have grounds for a lawsuit? Can he file an action against the government? And, and what would that look like? And would there be a, you know, a settlement? How much could he get? I, walk us through that, because it seems that that's where we're going next. This, this is primarily what I do is I, I sue the government for false arrest and for a wrongful conviction or malicious prosecution. Um, a lot of the components of that, at least for malicious prosecution, is you have to show that the prosecution was made without probable cause. And so that means that it had to have been the cops who screwed it up rather than a witness lying. So a lot of ways to look at this would be if the cops were somehow securing um, inaccurate statements from the witness, that the cops fabricated evidence. It can't be that the cops just dropped the ball. It has to be that they affirmatively did something um, because it's really hard to bring cases against prosecutors. Um, in, most, in most instances, they're completely immune from suit. Um, and the other way to do this is to show actual innocence, which is a whole different standard that's a lot harder. Just because your case gets dismissed, doesn't mean that there's actual innocence. So should he sue? Absolutely. Will there be a positive outcome? It remains to be seen. And Jana, we have a little over a minute. This key witness had said that she was pressured by two individuals to point the finger at Forbes and these other people. We don't understand why that would have been the case. Don't really know who these people are. What does that tell you? I think that's odd. And it's something that really should have been thoroughly investigated 40 years ago. I mean, why would, again, like you said, why would they pressure her? And, and when you're a prosecutor, why would you take the actual forensic evidence, like uh, the fact that they had a blue gas can, not a red gas can, and discount that in favor of a 19-year-old 
testimony. So I, there's just so much here. But can you imagine living half of your life behind bars, not uh, wrongfully? And I think this person is going to allege he's factually innocent. And all I can say is he better not hire Tom Girardi for that lawsuit because <laughs> that could be a problem. But I think he's got a good chance of success. You see, <laughs> mixing some stories there. Look, I'm curious to see <laughs> if now there'll be justice for Hall at all, and maybe they'll reopen investigation and look into it further as to what actually happened, which is what I think they should ultimately do. But uh, Jonna, mm -hmm. Katie, appreciate you taking the time here on Law and Crime Report. Everyone out there, thank you for joining us as we cover these top stories. Until next time, be safe, and we'll see you then. Mm -hmm.